This week, it's a very special podcast as I'm talking to one of my true business heroes, Joe Malone, CBE. One of the UK's most famous entrepreneurs, Joe started life on a council estate and left school with no qualifications. However, at a young age, she discovered what was set to be her future, her passion for fragrance. Working as a florist by day, she gave facials in her kitchen at night, giving her homemade nutmeg and ginger bath oil as a thank you to her clients. Soon, orders began to flood in, and together with her husband Gary, they opened her first Jo Malone London shop. Through word of mouth, her brand quickly became a monumental success, and within five years, she sold her business to Estee Lauder. Life wasn't full of roses, though, as Jo was told she had an aggressive form of cancer and not much time to live. But the ever-resilient Jo wasn't going to be told her life was over, and after recovering, decided to do it all over again. In 2011, she announced the launch of her new fragrance company, Jo Loves, of which she is the founder and creative director. I travelled to Elizabeth Street in London to have tea with Jo, surrounded by her beautiful fragrances. It really was one of the most special moments of my career, talking about starting all over again. Bow your head and let your eyelids close on down Where we're going you won't need to bring your frown I'm Holly Tucker and welcome to Conversations of Inspiration. Back in 2006, I found it not on the high street for my kitchen table. And since then, I've gone on to launch Holly & Co. I'm the UK ambassador of creative small businesses. And I believe that having a business doing what you love is the key to a happy, fulfilled life. My dream is to help everybody start theirs. I'm here to offer advice, inspiration, wisdom and encouragement. And in my view, the best way to do this is by sharing stories. So I've reached out to my favourite small businesses, entrepreneurs and those who simply inspire me and ask them to share theirs. Here are my conversations of inspiration. Jo, I cannot tell you the privilege to be sitting with you today here in your amazing Jo Loves Emporium of Smells. You're the queen of the kitchen table startups and one of the UK's biggest success stories. I've been such a huge fan of yours. You've been a role model for me and I know many women who look to you as someone very special. I can't quite believe my luck that I'm sitting across from you right now. Your story is one of the greatest business stories and I cannot wait to hear it firsthand. So thank you very much for your time. I know this is going to be a very special podcast. Thank you very much for, for inviting me. I'm I, you know, thrilled to be the queen of the kitchen table startups. What, <laughs> what a title. I can't wait to hear how you began Jo Malone London. But first, I wanted to talk to you about your nose. You have the most incredible nose, I hear, and it's nicknamed the Bloodhound, is this right? That's my nickname in, in the house, yeah, <laughs> the Bloodhound. Um, I'm dyslexic, and my sense of smell, I thought everybody could smell the way I smell. So I've, from a little girl, I could smell things that no one else could smell. But yes, my nickname is the Bloodhound, and uh, my son and my husband go, oh, here goes the Bloodhound, she's off. Um, so I, I, I heard that actually you can tell whether it's going to snow. Um, your husband tried to surprise you, but you smelt him before he'd actually surprised you that was in new york i had created him just you know just just so that we get the story correct i didn't smell him but i smelt the fragrance he was wearing which i'd created for him and i and it smelled it smelt very very different on him than anyone else so i walked into the hotel in new york and i went my husband's here and they said no no miss malone no he's not and i went yes he is i can smell him everywhere Got into Goodness. the lift, up to the room, and he was there as a surprise. But I, the bloodhound had <laughs> smelt him first. That is amazing. And can you smell weather? Yes, I can. I can smell if it's going to rain. Actually, rain is not too difficult because the air smells different. Snow has a really... I can't even describe it. It's like a... It, it's like a crunch in my nose. It, 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 that's the only way I can describe it. And I can smell if it's going to snow. I know when the dog's sick, I smelt a flood before it even happened in our house. And I kept walking in and saying, 
right there I can smell a wet wall and Gary just turned around and said to me oh don't be so stupid I said I can smell it every time I walk in here two weeks later we're sitting watching the tv whoosh straight through exactly where I'd smelt it and it was dripping and then it just exploded and um it, it, the whole place was uh, gutted and Gosh, I went, I've I told you anything. I could smell a wet it's wall. It's so extraordinary. And, and you've been an entrepreneur from a very young age. Do you think you were born with an entrepreneurial spirit? And what was the earliest memory of being enterprising? No, I don't think, I don't think anyone is born with an entrepreneurial spirit. But I think the people that need to survive had to develop an entrepreneurial spirit pretty quickly. And so I came from a two up, two down. We lived on a council uh, state my dad was an artist and a brilliant architect, but also a gambler. And my mum worked for a beauty company. She was a manicurist at Revlon for a while and then went on to into skincare. But I loved my family. I love, you know, unfortunately, they're all passed away now and gone. But it was a tough upbringing. It wasn't, it wasn't, um, I was the adult from the age of nine years old. So I would always go to the fridge as I left for school to go, what's the next meal? And it's funny, I still do that today. It's a, it's wow. a really weird thing. I go to the fridge and think, there's three meals, there's six eggs, there's a tin of beans. So if we lost everything today, I could feed my family. And that comes from that young child having to do that. I helped raise my sister and I would also help my mum. So I would, uh, we had, you didn't have washing machines in those days where you had, you put it all in. We had what was called a twin tub and we were really lucky to have a twin tub, but I would have to wash all the sheets. So I'd come home from school, have to wait up until nine o'clock when she came in and I would have to do a whole lot of washing and get all the linen ready for the next day for the clinic. Um, it wasn't a tough, it was a very happy childhood. I was very loved, but it wasn't easy. I think from those young sort of years having to survive, that's what taught me. And I think often that is the entrepreneurial spirit, that survival instinct that never quits. I'm not a quitter in life. And it came from my childhood. Could you tell me how the little Jo Malone came to then create her first shop? How did this all come about? So my first job was actually in a florist, not far away from here, to stop the road. And um, from there, I went to, my mum was very, very poorly. She, at that point, had a skincare clinic. So I went to work with her and I ran the skincare clinic. And by the time I was 21, 22, it was, OK, you've got to prove who you are now, girl. Can you do this on your own? I was just newly married to Gary, still married to Gary, by the way, a long, long time ago. But And we, he and I decided that we would give it a shot. He worked in the building industry. And I had 12 face clients that I would carry my massage bed from house to house and do their faces. And it was, OK, well, I wonder if we rented a small apartment. We had so little money. And I went to see this small apartment. It had no furniture in it, no curtains or anything. And I walked in and I thought, I can start here. I know I can. And, but it was six months' rent. So I managed to talk the woman round to letting me do one month's rent. I don't know how I did it. She was the most incredible woman called Sandra French, Australian. And she just saw this young kid with a dream. And she said, OK, but if you're, if you're late once, I, I promise you I'll never be late. And I, and I have never, never not paid a bill, never been late in my life for paying anything. And I said about uh, 12 clients and then... The word got round and then it was 20 and then it was 50, 500. And then I had EMI records bringing all their artists and all models one, all the models coming up. Then we had Robert Redford that wanted a, a spray on a movie. You know, it just literally, it just went like that. And this, and it was all to do with the product I was creating. And they were in funny little plastic bottles being made in my kitchen a kitchen. I didn't, the kitchen was too small for a kitchen table. It was on the side and I had four plastic jugs and a saucepan. And I would have these dreams in my head. I've got, I've got no qualifications as a perfumer. I've just got this natural ability. That's, you know, I can naturally join fragrances together. And um, I, created a, uh, I created a body lotion that when I was doing the skincare treatments, I would massage everybody's arms with these and I would come up with these crazy smells like nectarine and honey and lime basil and mandarin and nutmeg and ginger and you know all the French lime blossom and I turned that into a bath oil and it was that you know it's, it's really interesting there's always a moment in a business 
that a key goes in the door. You, you felt it as well. You put the, the key in the door point, the, and it unlocks moments, something yeah. and you suddenly walk into this world and you think, ooh, I never, I never dreamed, you know, this wasn't on my five-year plan or my strategy. <laughs> I still don't have a five-year plan. And, and you go into this world and that's what that little bath oil did. It was a nutmeg and ginger bath oil and one woman bought 100 bottles, put it at dinner, and then within... A month, 86 people wanted to buy the product and they wanted to buy hundreds at a time. That was the moment that took us. Within a few years, we were just like, I was neck deep in orders. Gary was about to divorce me because his pizza tasted of nutmeg and ginger and then the bath was full of seashells and, oh, it was, <laughs> that, that day wasn't a good day. And he went downstairs and he ate his dinner in the car and he came back and he said, I can't go on like this, we need a shop. And so we decided after sort of several days of me being really moody and looking at shops I didn't want, I realised actually we had to do something. Mm -hmm. And so we opened our first little store in, a, in um, Wharton Street. Day one, man walks in, offers me $1 million to sell my business that day, which really, I can't tell you, I still think of that moment and I think, if I'd taken that, I would never have lived this adventure. Sliding doors moment. It was, I wonder what would have happened mm. if, you know, if I had gone ahead um, and uh, for the next five years, we still slept on the floor and money was tight. But this little business was just growing and growing and she was... It, you know, she was growing faster than we could fund it. We opened in New York City. We hit a million dollars. No one, everyone said to us, actually, this is a good lesson. Everyone has told me who I should be in my life, and I've never listened to any of them. I've always fulfilled what my own dreams, and, and I've never been defined by other people. But when we opened in New York City, everyone said, you'll lose money. You'll never make money in New York City. And it's like, do you know what? Tell me something. Uh, tell me something I don't know. Tell me. Tell me something positive that's going to help me do this with a zero advertising budget, no marketing, and a hundred empty bags. We converted New York City, and we hit a million dollars within that first Christmas. So don't oh. be defined by other people's opinions. Gosh, I've got goosebumps. <laughs> I wanted to touch on your schooling. You left school with no qualifications, but you knew you'd found your passion. You knew what you were brilliant at, um, and going to university wasn't going to further that. You were lucky that you understood this so early on. I love the Einstein quote, everyone is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, <laughs> it will live its whole life believing it's stupid. You were clever in making your perfume. Do you think that you should be encouraged more in schools? And what advice would you give to parents out there or children out there mm. who are struggling to feel clever or to find that passion? Mm. Well, I think I didn't, I didn't realise that I'd found what I was brilliant at. I was surviving. That, and I think it's, even now, even now, I suppose, there is still that, that kid inside of me. When I was at school, I was sitting an exam and I'm horribly dyslexic. And I couldn't bear being the bottom of the class yet again. So it was a multiple choice exam. And I looked at the person's paper next to me. And I just, I just felt so, I don't know, just second class. And the teacher caught me doing it and she made me stand on my chair and she said in front of the whole class, Joe Malone, you will never make anything of your life. You're lazy and you're stupid. And it stuck with me. Now, I never let that define me because I knew I wasn't lazy and I knew I wasn't stupid. I just couldn't do it in the same way. And actually, over the last two years and the life that I've lived, I, don't, I still don't have any qualifications. And the only time I ever went to university when I spoke at Harvard two years ago, which was the most momentous moment for me to walk in to that auditorium. I'd never been to a university and yet there I was sitting teaching the students of the future about business and all I had was my story. So yet again, don't be defined by other people's opinions of you. But two, but uh, sorry, last year, last year when my, I have a teenage son and he was waiting for his GCSE o, o level results and he came through with straight A's. But there was a couple of people who were in our house party, that the kids did not get those grades. And they had to leave the school. They, they looked at their piece of paper and I saw the devastation in their faces and it really affected me. And suddenly this group of young people suddenly feel second class, they're mm -hmm. not worthy, society has thrown them out. Wrong, absolutely wrong. 
And it made me realise that I had to do something to try and help these young people because I know what that feeling's like. Um, I wasn't as smart as my son. But if you're not academic and you don't have... And everybody has a diamond. Everybody has something about them that is utterly brilliant. You just have to find it. But if you don't, have, if you don't believe that you're worthy in the first place, you'll never find it. So I came up with, a, with an idea, which actually I started a conversation, and this is part of that conversation, to bring entrepreneurialism into the national curriculum from the ages of 7 to 17. Here, here, Brilliant. Fantastic. So everything that, you, that young people learn, they don't connect the subjects, but in fact, they're, they're, they're all equipped. But if we did that from 7 to 17, do you know within five years... We would have a generation of young people that leave school, regardless of their ability, that know how to build. And if there is ever a time in this country when our generation deserves something and a gift, it's this. This will cost no money. We're going to rally every entrepreneur Please. and every creator Please, across this country. Yes, you can. And you're on that list. Thank Please. you very much. To share your story. That's all I'm going to ask. And that we support the teachers because... You know what? They don't need any more boxes to tick. And we're going to say as an army of entrepreneurs, we will help. We will help you educate these children. So I've taken it to the government. They're very excited as to they haven't quite come back to tell me what all that. But if not, I'm going to find another way (laughs) and I will rally an army and we will equip the next generation of young people because I know what that feeling's like to feel second class. It's so interesting that you talk about this. Um, I left school, I got a D in my A-level business studies and I went to University of Life, publicist advertising agency. So I started (laughs) work at 17 and um, I learned everything I knew from Mm. being the bottom of the bottom run. I was the T girl and worked my, my way through But one of my passions at Holly & Co is children. So um, my little part of this is at Holly & Co, I'm starting an entrepreneur's school for 13 to 16-year-olds. Oh, that's wonderful. It's only next door. It's going to be very small. But it it was just my little part to play in saying, can I help these kids understand Mm. how to build a business and the fact that they do know how to do it? We're just Mm. not telling them, well, that's Mm. maths. Yeah. And this is English. It's not, and this is art. It's this not is rocket why. science. This is, is how you can do it. And I, I didn't go to university and I didn't get brilliant grades mm. and things. So whatever you need me to do. Thank you. I meet so many small businesses um, who have dyslexia. I'm dyslexic. As we know, many, many entrepreneurs are dyslexic. But I know that some find it very difficult. I actually had a um, someone reach out to me today on social media that they've had to stop their business because dyslexia mm. is really holding them back. Can you tell me about how dyslexia has played a part in your adult life while Mm. building your company and how have you combated things that might have been difficult? I don't know a life without dyslexia. So I still struggle telling um, my left and my right. So being in a car with me is is a real take your life in your own hands. But in business, there are things that I can't do. Um, I can read my own writing in some, for some, you know, sort of, reason but I really struggle with anything else so if I'm reading a book I'll I kind of miss huge chunks of it and I'm racing and I'm just I'm picking out words if I'm really stressed what happens is all of the letters on the page move around so I'm chasing the word trying to find the word and trying to to pick up so when I'm really stressed I need help if I go into a bank and they give me a form or I go anywhere and I have to fill out a form, I can feel that sense of anxiety and panic because it's like I'm going to feel stupid. Now, I'm just not I'm not afraid to say, could somebody help me, please? I went to, to America just recently. And when you check in, you have to check in now with a machine. And honestly, I thought I, I had to take a beta blocker to stop my heart pounding. And it's like I'm not going to get on the plane and I can't I'll still check myself in the wrong plane and everything. And I just thought, come on, Joe. you know, you're a woman, 50 years old, just go and ask for help. This charming man came over and I said, I'm dyslexic. Please don't worry, I'll help you. And actually when I, and what I was doing, I said, can you show me that again? And I was, I was putting it in my memory and I was thinking, okay, step one, two, three. And I put pictures or colors towards things so that I can remember the order in which they, in which they flow. So not everybody can do everything. 
And that makes me really sad that somebody who's dyslexic wants to ha- put her business down because you know what? She's probably very creative, very visionary. Find somebody that can do the bit that you can't. That's what life is all about. The to the young. And and does it really matter if we, you, you know, I still struggle a little bit from time to time, but the thing, I'm changing the world with what? My gift, making, painting people with fragrance. You know what? Find somebody that can help you. You know, where are, we have this big word sort of mentors today, but what I say, where are your friends? Mm. Where are the mm. people that, that you sit down and have Sunday lunch with? Is mm. there someone that could help you mm. for a period of time? And says, keep going. And just say, don't quit. Mm. Don't, you know, don't quit. And sometimes in life when we, I would say, never quit on a bad day, ever, because you never quit on a good day, do you? Mm. Ever. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes when you get to the edge of that mountain and it's a sheer drop, and trust me, I've just come through this, it's a literally sheer drop below, below you and you just think, that's it, that's it, it's over. And then you just look over the cliff edge and you can see a ledge big enough for your foot. That's enough. That's enough not to quit and it's enough to take one step and say, okay, not today. I'm going to try one more thing. And dyslexia is not a disability. It's the ability to think differently. That's all it is. Our mission at Holly & Co. is to support creative small businesses through sharing useful, tangible, soulful content all year round. Whether you have your own business already or you're thinking of taking that leap of faith and pursuing your lifelong business dream, I'm here to support you. I know what you're thinking. How can I keep up to date with all this inspiration, Holly? Well, it's simple. Just head over to Instagram and follow at Holly Tucker and at Holly.co so you don't miss a thing. By following these accounts, you'll be the first in line to receive all of my exciting podcast updates, hear my personal thoughts as I share the lessons I've learned the hard way, and absorb this colourful, amazing, creative community that I shine a light on every single day. And let's not forget, you'll be notified each time I'm hosting an IGTV live, often with special guests industry experts or hosting a Q&A with the small business community answering those business questions you just can't Google. So what are you waiting for? Get following. I can't wait for you to join me. Now let's get back to our conversation of inspiration. Your first shop was on Walton Street. What were those early days of running a shop like and I'd love to hear you just describe a typical day in that startup frenzy I'm assuming it was I I have to say starting the second business was tougher than the first one because the first time I I didn't know what we were heading into it was um it was it it was busy I mean (laughs) hours I I think we went to bed at midnight and got up at six and got the shop ready, did all this, because I was still running the skincare clinic at that time. So I would do faces. So you were doing both? I, well, we had two people in the shop and I would run down because the, the clinic and the shop were not far apart from each other. So I would finish my first three faces, still be in my white coat, see me pelting down the street to cover for lunch hours. So they would go to lunch, then I would cover lunch and then I'd run back, do the next thing. Then I'd run back at seven o'clock, fill up the shelves and it was like that for, for the first year, you know, it was, but, but like lots of businesses, sometimes people have to piggyback two jobs. Um, Gary had left the building industry by that point. So he was solely in, in the business and we managed it. You know, I was lucky to have my business partner was my husband. Well, some would say lucky. <laughs> um, personally, it was the he is the best business partner in the world and uh, my great friend. So it was absolutely the right decision for us. But And so we supported one another, but it, it wasn't easy. You know, it wasn't, uh, I think people, when they see a successful business, think, you know, I was so lucky. Luck didn't come into it. It really didn't. It was, you know, 98% perspiration, 2% inspiration. And you just had to, you kept at it day in, day out. But we did see this, in five years, I'd sold my business to Estee Lauder. So the, you, you can see the, you know, the growth in that was phenomenal. So you built a brand. It flew. Yep. You then, though, had 
a period of life and time where there were lots of transitions, transitions to where we're sitting here today mm. at Joe Loves. But you also went through real downs and roller coasters. Mm. Can you describe that period from between it took off to where we are today? So I sold my business to Estee Lauder. And, and when, um, when we did that deal, I thought it was, I thought it was going to stay forever and ever. I was, how old was I? About 36, 37. And I'd gone from the council estate girl and then suddenly sitting in 1A, 1B, everywhere I went, travelling around the world. And, you know, it was dream come true, I've got to be honest. But a curveball came from nowhere. And my, I just had my little boy. He was two. And I started to feel, and I'd had hyperemesis. So I was very, very sick through, through my pregnancy. And I thought it was the after effects of that. And I was in New York City shooting a brochure and I found a lump in my breast. I called my doctor and he said, as soon as you get home, we're going to get it checked. So I jumped on the plane straight away. I never even dreamed that it could be cancer. I just, I felt like one of those people that, you know, had had, had my fair share of, of rough times, but it was breast cancer and it was a very aggressive form. So I spent, I was told that I had probably a year to live. And again, that spirit of, no one's going to tell me who I am and where I'm going. Certainly not when I'm going to die. But I was scared. I was very scared. I called the amazing Evelyn Lauder, flew to New York City, and was the, one of the first women to take very um, small amounts of chemotherapy very close together. So I did that for a year, came through, and I was a different person. So I think in order to understand where I am today, it's important to understand why I left in the first place. I didn't leave because my earnout had finished. I didn't leave because I was unhappy. I left because I'd had a life-changing situation and I wasn't the same person. So I handed in my resignation to Joe Malone. Everyone tried to change my mind. And then I realised the nearer I got to the day of leaving, I'd made the biggest mistake of my life. And this is such a lesson. We're human beings. We make mistakes. We make calls in our life that are wrong, but it doesn't mean to say that you can't make it right. So I left and I was in a five-year lockout. And in that five-year lockout, I was probably the most unhappy person I've ever been in my life. I had no purpose. The, the jewel that I talk about of creating fragrance, that diamond, just lay, you know, just to the side. I couldn't walk through a department store and smell fragrance. I was so unhappy. But I had to try and put my life back together again. And by the time we got to the end of that five-year earn out, I knew I had to to go back. If I didn't, I was going to I was going to end up regretting and I've never had regrets in my life. And I feel life is too long and too short. So I decided to start another another brand around the kitchen table all over again with those same four plastic jugs. But there was the legal implications of you know, there was Joe Malone London, the cream and black box. There was me who was Joe Malone. I didn't have a cream and black box, but I created the cream and black box. And then I was going to create another brand. Who was it going to be? And I realized that I wasn't that person anymore who had created, I'd moved on in my life. Things had changed in me. So who was I now? And so start, I started that journey of discovering who Joe really was again. It was my son that came up with the name for the brand. We thought of all sorts of strange and weird names. And he was sitting at the tea table one day and he was sitting watching me do. And I went, oh, what am I going to call it? And he went, oh, mum, just call it Joe Loves. And he said, because you love what you do. And it was so authentic. And it was, yeah, yeah, maybe that, maybe I can call it Joe Loves. And so we registered it. We launched the brand and... <laughs> It was like running off the edge of a cliff without a parachute. And I hit the ground, like, really hard. And it didn't work in the first year. And I got all the packaging wrong. The things I got right were the first four fragrances in Joe Love, which um, as Pomelo was the very first one I created. And it's our number one fragrance today. That first year, I wanted to quit every single day. I felt so humiliated. I felt so stupid. What had I done? Why on earth did I think I could come back? No one had known I'd left the old brand. Then I was over here. The, the lawyers are saying, you can't confuse the consumer. I mean, it came... Uh, there was a lot of stupidity when I, when I think about it. And I had to 
work my way through that step by step by step. And I would think to myself, I'd go to bed every night and think, right, that's it. I'm going to quit. And every morning I think, just one more day, one more day, one more day. And here we are, years on, and one more day turned into one more year, turned into five years, turned into changing the world. But it was very, very tough for the first year. Did you have that feeling that, well, I've done it once, you know, I've got those battle scars. I, I, I pretty much know my industry. Um, so this should be, you know, come on. There's yeah. no, no other person qualified like myself to t- tackle this. You'd think. I would have known. I, I mean, I sometimes look back and I think I was so... I so wanted to enter back into the industry. I so wanted to create fragrance. Mm. I didn't want it as a hobby. I wanted to create a global brand. That was that mm-hmm. was from day one where my mindset was. Um I, it was a different different world. I mean, when we first started out, we were the weren't the pioneers of the way. And then suddenly there's all these great little indie brands all the way across. So it wasn't it wasn't just us. We were, mm. you know, joining a whole army of SMEs. And I'm proud of that. I'm proud that we were part of taking that baton and saying, you know, it's possible. That story is possible. When I look back now, because I believe nothing is wasted in life, I look back at those mistakes I made and it took me on a journey. It took me down. It stripped me back to everything that I am. And it made me remember who the heartbeat of Joe really is. And so it's humiliating and it hurts. But now I'm through that. I just think I changed. Mm. And in turn, my business changed because I started to see all those things. So if I'd taken 10 years in building it, like any person does, but no, not me. I wanted everything. I mean, I am impetuous and I am a control freak. And it's like um, I can see where I'm meant to be and I want to be there. I don't want to be sitting here. You know, that patience I probably should have observed um, a little bit more. My husband kept saying to me, wait, wait, wait. No, straight straight down and fell over. Um, but I think now I can use that story and help others and also for others to believe it's okay. It's okay to fail. You know what? Failure, I heard something the other day which really disturbed me. It's put failure in a cupboard. No, don't. Failure, failure, don't put it Isn't in a it cupboard. when we learn our most? Learn. Learn. Yeah. Sometimes when you learn how not to do something, it's more valuable mm. than how to do something. And I think once I once I'd sort of figured it out and had to repackage everything and rebrand everything and go through that process, and then this was my um, this little shop here that we're sitting in in Elizabeth Street. This was my birthday present, my 49th birthday present for my husband, and he gave me a key. And he said to me, go be a shopkeeper again because you were an absolute nightmare, um, which I would agree with. And came here. And, of course, this is where I had my first job. I used to sit on that doorstep with a bacon sandwich and a cup of tea when the markets used to come in. And I walked in here and I walked into this room, which was a really funny little office with tapestry walls. It was awful. And I heard life say, you will, cha- you will build a global brand from this room. My goodness. And I heard it and I thought, right. Okay, rolled up my sleeves. That's where I'm going. That's where I'm heading. What and that's, a special um, man that he did that. Surpri- he's incredible. Yeah. Well, I knew it was on the market, but I, I didn't think we'd be able to afford it. So, so he wanted you to are. start again, full circle. We, we, we returned full circle, yeah. Gosh. I often feel like not in the high street is my first child who's gone off to uni. <laughs> and then Holly and Co is my second child. Do you feel like that about Joe Loves? I I do, actually. I think that's a really good... I feel... I look at Joe Malone with such pride. that I I created that from a kitchen. You know, a kitchen, I created that. And the biggest global corporation in the world couldn't create it. They had to buy it. I mean, that... No one can take that away from me. But I look at her with... I don't relate to it creatively anymore. But I look and every now and again... I remember in those five years, I couldn't go past the shop. And I live very close to the shop in Sloane Street. And I would divert, I would walk all the way around the back so I didn't have to pass her. And one day, coming back from the airport, the taxi drove down Sloane Street. And I go, no, 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 excuse me, excuse me. And he said, we were stuck in traffic. And we were stuck right outside the shop. And I remember looking down thinking, look up, look up. And I looked and I felt tears well in my eyes. Because when you build a business, and it's like your best friend, isn't it? You see, it, you go through all the emotions like you were with a person, highs, lows, you know, celebrations and then late nights. And it was my best friend. And I felt 
the brand, I still sometimes feel the brand look at me and they say, do you remember who we were? And it's like, I will always remember who we were, always. But you're safe, you're in good hands, and, and my life has, you know, taken me. But I would never hear a bad word said against that brand. And, um, in fact, recently when I saw all those people copying, I hurt for Joe Malone. It really hurt me that somebody could just take what we what was created and just copy it like that and get away with it. And uh, it, I really... It really made me angry as well that uh, somebody could do that to a brand that was so amazing. I sometimes, as I, I mentioned, I look at it as a child, that you know every hair on its head. You um, have dressed mm. it when it was tiny and you've watched it grow up into becoming a smelly teenager. And you know <laughs> they, they, it's, it's made its mistakes and you were there when they were poorly. And actually, I find that you can let it go. But it's what I mentioned to SMEs, and I know you're incredibly proud of SMEs and you're a mm. cheerleader, that I do make sure they realise that they're the Duracell battery of their business. Mm. It's their they, responsibility. It, yeah. They are the DNA. Yeah. SMEs are, that there has never been a more power. So SME means small to medium enterprise, but I think they mean seriously motivated entrepreneurs who believe in what they do. This is an army of people that have helped our economy. Their voice has never been more powerful and never is there a time that they need more support because 30% of SMEs fail in the first year. And that's often because they start out and then they either lack funds or the ability to take the business to the next level. And we really, to, actually going back to what I was talking about, the National Curriculum for Children, this will, will actually take that percentage down because those children will then be able to go into small businesses and help and know how to build, have that mentality and that mindset. But I, I know what it is, so, so do you, to be, and I, I surround myself with people that have built small businesses and um, we come from all kinds of walks of life. But it's still, it still takes the same strength and energy I'm passionate about sharing our stories because that inspires others. And then just by telling a story or reading a story or finding something out, you think to yourself, if they can do it, I can do it. And if they did it that way, I can do it this way. It's just about, you know, thinking differently and encouraging people. And, you know, that's where I believe apprenticeships come in, where young people, if they're not kind of in the box for university, you know what, we should be taking this group of young people and saying, Absolutely. you're worth something, Absolutely. let's put you into apprenticeship, let's teach you. Um, and in our company, we've had three, four young people go through like a management program, they spend three months in every side of the company. And at the moment, they've all, they've all gone through, one went off, uh, ran a social media campaign, they went off to do um, another job and is very successful. Um, and the other three are still with us. So you know, these people do need to feel that they have value and they can do something that changes the world. You've built two brands. And when I talk to small businesses and I, and I mentioned to them that when I started Not in the High Street, we didn't have such a thing as social media. I really wish, mm. actually, that we might have and that everything was a form. I don't. <laughs> Well, it might have made it a little easier. So we had emails, you know, I had a lot of um, tech investors who used to just almost fall off their chair when I said, you know, we said, we're going to do a catalogue. You know, why would we do a catalogue? And this was in the day and age when people were scared about putting their credit card details oh, in okay. a computer. Okay, so, but things have changed and they're just... Still are, by the way. <laughs> and they're speeding up, you know, they're speeding up. They're, things are really um, shifting quickly. How have you found that difference between your first experience building mm. a brand and now building Joe Loves in this landscape? A completely different experience, yeah, but that's life. You, you know, every industry will have that from fashion to music to film to tech. Um, it, it's where life is moving on. And when we... It's funny, I was... I was looking the other day at Generation K, which is the generation that will challenge us, and I realised... Why will it challenge us? Well, because... Well, well hold on. So, yeah, sorry, so, sorry. No, no. So, so, you know, we're looking at the millennials, we're looking at yes. all of their... How their voice... And, and that's really what we're talking about, that the millennials have brought in a whole new world for us to communicate. Generation K is almost going back. It's almost taking... And I, I recognise the young Joe as Generation K, 
Mm, I was I was one of those. So we're almost returning back to this sense of will we go back to sending press releases by paper? No. But it's the but it's this mentality and it's these this group of young people who are really questioning. They're questioning in us, they're challenging us, they they want to do it different, they're disruptors. And at 16 years old, I was a disruptor and I didn't really understand and, and I couldn't fit in. So I'm, I have more to relate to Generation K than I ever possibly thought, you know, within my own generation. But I think we have to get used to change. Change is going to happen and it's going to keep pushing us and testing us. And the more comfortable we become as businesses and don't hear that voice the more danger we put ourselves look at our high street right now mm. it's it's being challenged because it became comfortable and it sat back and now everyone's playing catch up and it's a scary time so get ready for change it's going to be part of everyone's business it needs to be part of your mentality it needs to be part of your core values in your company because that is where you will guarantee the future I always use the analogy that running your own small business is like being on a roller coaster. Can I ask what one of your proudest moments Mm. has been? It's just recently. And um, I've had lots of proud moments. I've had big ones, small ones. But I think I'd had a really terrible day at the office about four months ago. And I'd lost... Um, the potential project and I really wanted it more than anything and I'd worked so hard at the presentation and I came in second so I lost it and I was gutted absolutely gutted and I went home felt really sorry for myself walked in kitchen table there's a letter from Downing Street and I thought oh now what you know it was just ugh. And I opened it and it was from Buckingham Palace to say that I had been awarded a CBE in the Queen's Honours list. Congratulations. And, well, I thank you very much. I read it first and thought, oh, it's come to the wrong address. It's not me. It can't be me. You know, commander of the British Empire. Come on, Joe. And then I read it and it was like, oh, my goodness, it is me. And it was the most humbling. I made a cup of tea, sat and cried with the dog and just realised that I had to do something to change the world, that, that I had been honoured. And you get this incredible beautiful letter from the Queen, all in old writing, as though, you know, it's come from hundreds of years ago. And there's one line, it says, our beloved servant. And it was, Mm. it has been, I I receive it in November, but it's been one of the most um, amazing moments, I think, for me. I know a roller coaster, you have lots and ups and downs. Is there a low that stands out? I think the the night we opened in Selfridges and I saw the packaging and the pop-up shop and I knew I hated it and there was nothing I could do. That was a pretty low moment. For Joe Loves. For Joe Loves. But, you know, again, you look at her today, she's white, red and, and shining. So it took me on a journey, but that was a pretty low moment and thinking, what have I done? And I had to pick myself up from that and, um, yeah, shed a few tears that night. Joe, it's been one of the most wonderful moments of my career actually sitting in front of you and hearing your story you're such an inspiration and one gutsy lady Thank um, you. you're incredibly resilient you're blinking entrepreneurial you're a force of nature and it's made um you've made the business landscape a better and more inspiring place and um, thank you, Holly. Thank what you very thing to much say. thank you every podcast i ask my guests to prepare a letter to their younger self i don't hear these until now but i thank you for sharing sharing a part of your soul with us today and I'm so looking forward to hearing this one so over to you Joe. right hold on to read my own writing now dear Joe, happy 16th birthday you're about to start your very first job good luck I know you feel at this moment that the weight of the world lies on your shoulders you think will it ever be different yes it will I promise but just take a minute and realize What a hard-working, tenacious, incredible young woman you are. You have survived. You will go through life and have many highs and lows, but the grit that you have within you, your never, never quit attitude, will be an asset that will help you to pursue your dreams. Remember, nothing is ever wasted. I know you probably won't believe this, but you'll go on to change the world and you'll leave an imprint that will last for many generations. You will bring laughter, happiness and fulfilment to many. You'll marry a man who will be your best friend and soulmate all the way through your life and I promise you'll never be alone again. 
You'll have a son that will be the greatest blessing you can imagine and you will know a love that will change you forever. Joe, don't always be in a hurry to get to the destination. Enjoy the moment. Celebrate it. Because I promise life will pass quickly. Your lack of education, your dyslexia and all of the things that you think have prevented you from fulfilling your dreams will in fact be the greatest gift. They will make them happen. Don't be afraid to think differently. It's who you are and people will love you for that. <laughs> Don't be afraid to shed tears and embrace and enjoy laughter. Leave disappointment in the day that it happens. Don't take it into tomorrow. And remember, you are the one that can fulfill your dreams. Good luck on your first day. It is the start of a shopkeeper's adventure. Enjoy it. This love will never leave your life. I'm sorry. See you on the other side of age. I will be waiting. Love, Joe. P.S. The bucket of water you are about to throw over your boss in the next few months is not a great idea. <laughs> Joe, thank you very much for sharing such <laughs> that last um, line. a lovely, lovely letter. And um, from everyone who's listening, it really your words will maybe change their lives. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. If you've enjoyed this episode with Joe Malone, I'd love to suggest listening to my conversation with Bobby Brown. You can find my conversation with Bobby by searching Conversations of Inspiration wherever you get your podcasts. And if you've enjoyed listening, if it's helped or inspired you, would you mind rating and reviewing? Your support really does mean the world to me. It helps spread the word and will inspire more people to build a life they love. And for all our latest news, you can sign up to my weekly newsletter, Holly's Desk Notes, over at holly.co. Mm-hmm.